tired of the taste. Two-hour season premiere, Thursday, January 2nd, 8, 7 central on ABC. <laughs> in the country, the author of one of the most influential bestsellers of all time, The Purpose Driven Life. And he delivered the invocation at Obama's 2009 inauguration. But he's also a man whose faith has been tested by tragedy. Please welcome Pastor Rick Warren. Yeah, here. Last year marked the 10th anniversary of your best-selling book, The Purpose Driven Life. Now, it has sold over 36 million copies. I got seven of them. Second book, second book in the world, and that's behind the Bible. I mean, you and Jesus are neck to neck right now. <laughs> what do you see as your purpose? Uh, you know, life's all about love. One day, uh, a guy was walking down the street, and he asked Jesus, says, what's the most important command? And Jesus said, I'll summarize the whole Bible in two sentences. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbors yourself. That's it. Okay? Learn to love God. Learn to love other people. That's it. Learn to love God. Learn to... So life's all about learning how to love. You started Saddleback Church in 1980. I did. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. And you said you would devote 40 I had, years. I had one member. It was my wife. Mm -hmm. I preached the first sermon. She said it was too long. Yeah. And downhill go. ever since. There you go. You said you dedicate 40 years of your life to it. Yeah. And you're coming up on year 34, I believe. Yeah, right. So exactly. How's that looking for you? Are you still going to be well, able to walk away? The word retirement isn't actually in the Bible, so I don't I plan on retiring. <laughs> uh, but actually what we're doing is, is I'm doing a lot more international work. The last 10 years, uh, we've been doing a thing called the Peace Plan, which mm -hmm. is P-E-A-C-E. -E, promote reconciliation, wherever there's conflict. Uh, equip ethical leaders, assist the poor, care for the sick, educate the next generation. And in the last 10 years, I've had 23,869 of my members in 196 countries yes. doing those five things. But you've had your own, your own tragedy, and yeah. you said that, yeah, that right this right. past year was one of the worst years. That no, you, it was the your, worst year of my life. Because your, your, your youngest son, Matthew, who yeah. had had uh, mental emotional illness. mental illness, yeah. committed suicide. Yeah. I mean, we all, you know, you read about it and you just want to hug you. Thank you. But there are people who don't have your kind of faith. Right. And, and how do they cope? And especially this time of year, you feel lost more than any other time. What do you say to people who just don't have that kind of faith to fall back on? Yeah. Well, that's one of the reasons why I, I don't know how people go through tragedy without faith. I really don't. Uh, I, I don't know how they do it. Um, uh, when Kay was pregnant with our youngest child uh, 27 years ago, she got a very, I don't know, uh, kind of disease where she had a rash over her body, was crippled mm -hmm. during the pregnancy, couldn't get out of bed. I changed a bedpan for months. Mm -hmm. and, and I had three fears going through my mind. Is my wife going to live? Is the baby going to live? And will the baby be healthy? Mm -hmm. Kay lived, Matthew lived, but he wasn't healthy. And he struggled for 27 years with mental illness. Tender heart, troubled mind, tortured mind. He had an ability to walk in the room and instantly know who was in the most pain, because mm -hmm. he was in pain. Mm -hmm. And he spent that time. And then uh, when he took his life uh, in uh, uh, April, it, it really was the worst day of my life. What do you tell yourself is God's purpose? Yeah. Well, the first place, not everything that happens in the world is God's will. When people say, oh, that must have been God's will, there's nonsense to that. Okay? Just nonsense. Uh, that's why we're to pray in the Lord's Prayer, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Why? Because in heaven it's always done, and it's always done perfectly. On earth, God's will is rarely done. If I go out and I get drunk and I get in a car accident and I kill somebody, that's not God's will. That's my will. God didn't take my son's life. Matthew took his life. So you're talking about free will and free yeah, choice. Yeah, yeah. The, now, the important thing you were asking about, what do you say to somebody going through pain? I've actually watched my pain now for six months, kind of observing myself. And, and I've gone through what I call the six stages of grief. Mm -hmm. You know, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross talked about four stages of dying. Yeah. But I actually think there are six stages of grief. The first stage is shock. Mm -hmm. Okay, you're just in shock. And when you have a son take his life, that shock wasn't a day, it was a month. Mm -hmm. And I kept waiting for my, each night for my, my son to walk in the front door and watch TV with me. Because we, in fact, I'd seen him the night before, he'd come over and watch television. Mm -hmm. uh, so shock is, is a very human emotion. And the second one is sorrow. 
Sorrow is actually a godly emotion. The Bible says God grieves. Mm -hmm. What happens, what is God doing when my son uh, took his life? He's grieving too. The Bible says God weeps. In fact, the Bible says the only reason we have emotions is because we're made in his image. We have emotions because God's an emotional God. So you go from shock to sorrow, then you go to the third stage, which is struggle. And that's when you start asking the why. Why me? Why now? Why this? And everybody, why God? Why God? And, there's, and there's actually, there's, there's, there's no, nothing wrong with asking why. I mean, even Jesus on the cross does it. He goes, my God, my God, why? So if it, Jesus could ask it, I guess I could do Here's the question, what are you going to do when you don't get an answer, because you're not? You've got to move to stage four, which is okay. surrender. Yeah. And surrender, I remember writing in my journal, I'd rather walk with God and have this comfort than have all the answers and not, not walk with God. You see, what we want in tragedy is we want an explanation. Explanations never comfort. No. If my wife Kay dropped dead tomorrow and you told me why and I knew the reason, it wouldn't make, take away any of the pain. Mm -hmm. So expert, stop looking for an answer why. It never, what you need is the presence of God in your life. You need the comfort of God in your life. So you move from shock to sorrow to s struggle to surrender. And then there's two more ones, I call it sanctification, which means when God starts bringing good out in your own life, he starts changing you. I'm not the same guy I was six months ago. Yeah. I'm just not. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm more tender, I'm more sympathetic, so I'm more loving. That's part of God's plan. Well, he always, here's the thing, and then the last one is stage six is service. God wants you to take your pain and use it to help You've others. So, done that. But, yeah, but who could better help somebody with an emotionally, a Down syndrome child than a mother of a Down syndrome child? Who could better help somebody going through the struggle with an addiction? Somebody's been addicted. God wants to take the thing you're most embarrassed about, that you're most ashamed of, that you're most afraid of, you most like to hide, and make that your life message. You know, you, I, it, it's funny because I'm around a lot of churches and I, I've heard pastors say, because I deal with, you know, yeah. depression in, in my family, and I've heard pastors say, you know, depression is from the devil, yeah. and you can't be a Christian if you're, you're, you can't believe in God if you have mental illness, because it's a, when you get and a that's like a big, that's a crocodile and abalone, that's a crocodile. Okay, yeah, so <laughs> that's like, you even call that, you even call that the last taboo it is in the churches, because it's yeah. such a stigma, and people are so ashamed to say, I'm dealing with mental illness. You know, illness. I thought the last two but taboo actually in church was AIDS, and for 10 years, my wife, Kay, and I have spent literally given millions of dollars to help people with HIV, AIDS, book profits from right. things like that. 40 million people have AIDS, 400 million people have mental illness. Mm -hmm. And actually, when, as a pastor, there are different levels of grief. And uh, the hardest, the easiest grief is when uh, uh, an elderly couple die. They've lived a good life, they're ready to die, ready to go to heaven, that's pretty easy. More difficult death of a spouse. More difficult than that is the death of a spouse with a child at home, then a child, and then a suicide. Now, I'm doing the funeral of a child, which is tough, and I've done a lot of my child, a suicide, and I'm a public figure. Yeah. And it's not easy when your child's name is going across the CNN ticker with all these words. Well, he had kept his illness a secret. Well, you know what, we, we, it wasn't a secret to people who were close to him. Okay. And Kay and I have always known that we were gonna end up being spokespeople for mental illness because God doesn't waste a hurt. But it was Matthew's story to tell. So to protect his dignity, we kind of were hoping that he would, he would either find a, a cure, be healed, or find medicine to help. You know, when, when Matthew died, I probably received, Kay and I probably received maybe 30, 35,000 letters of condolences. Mm -hmm. And by the way, thank you, everybody who prayed in America. But the ones that meant the most to me, the letters, were not from VIPs, mm -hmm. rock stars and presidents, but it was people who actually, Matthew, had led to faith in Christ. Mm -hmm. And I remember writing in my journal that day, in God's garden of grace, even a broken tree can bear fruit. You know, you also talked about how important it was just to comfort each other and hug. Well, Absolutely. You know, you Absolutely. Thank you so much. Very sharing your personal story. Let me, let, let me say this to those of you. When you have some, the greater the pain, the fewer words you use. 
I hope we'll do it. Yes. Yeah. You know what people need is touch, yeah. not words. Well, thank you so much. And I'm so grateful that we're going to continue this because you're not going anywhere. We will be right back with Pastor Rick Warren to talk about his most recent project. A new label.